Uh, yeah, good afternoon. It's Whiskey Wednesday. Spirits Guy coming to you guys live from what you said, Wine and Spirits, out here in West Wilson. What's going here on, Here with guys? my boy, Corey. Um, <clears throat> fresh off our American Whiskey Bracket Challenge uh, in our winner, uh, Redwood Empire, The Lost Monarch. The winner. Very, very excited about that. Uh, and I'm very, very excited about this today. Um, and I know I say that about every week, but... <laughs> Anytime we get to hang out and drink together, it's always a good time. Oh, yeah. Um, and much like I do when I start research for all of this stuff, I end up deep down in a rabbit hole. Um, so a lot of really cool info uh, to share today. Today we're doing a threefer. Um, by the way, uh, we're going to do a, a Spirits Guide sort of bonus episode after this. Uh, Spirits Guide on Tuesday nights, I do Tuesday night flights sampling of three different whiskeys. Yeah. So we're kind of doing the same thing tonight. Um, we have three different offerings from George Dickel uh, that we carry here in What Use It Wine and Spirits. Now, Dickel is what's known as a Tennessee whiskey. Um, Tennessee whiskey follows all the same rules as bourbon. 51% uh, corn. Yeah. Um, distilled to 160, go to barrel at 125. Um, aged in new charred oak. But the difference with Tennessee whiskey is one, it has to be made in Tennessee, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and Tennessee whiskey goes through something called the Lincoln County process, um, which is basically after they make the distillate, they f filter it through charcoal. Oh, yeah. Kind of like a Brita filter. Um, typically it's maple, so they make their own maple charcoal, and then they filter the distillate. Through it, so think of it like a big Brita filter uh, that it goes through um, before they put it in the barrel. <coughs> so, <clears throat> there's a little history on Tennessee whiskey that I think you'll find kind of fascinating. In the mid 1800s, Tennessee was one of the biggest producers of spirits in the country. Okay. Um, as they hit the Civil War. Uh, right before that, George Dickel is owning a general store in Nashville. Civil War kicks in. They shut down all production of whiskey in Tennessee so that supplies can go to the troops. Uh, so, again, uh, Tennessee, no whiskey during the Civil War. Come out of the Civil War, George Dickel starts a wholesale company where he starts selling liquor in his retail business. This goes on until Prohibition. Now, Prohibition hits America in 1920. Tennessee went dry in 1910. They took it upon themselves 10 years before the rest of the country. They shut down. Yeah. So Tennessee is a dry state in 1910. They move production of George Dickel out of Tennessee to the Stitzel, which would later become the Stitzel Weller, yeah. Distillery in Kentucky. Oh, okay. So George Dickel was made at Stitzel Weller at one point. Cool little fact. Yeah. Um, and it was marketed as George Dickel's Cascade Whiskey, because the original name of the distillery was Cascade uh, Distillery, which is in Cascade Hollow. The brand gets sold a couple of times. It ends up being owned by Shenley, who was a big, big liquor company in the 1950s. Shenley produces it at OFC Distillery in Kentucky. OFC Distillery is now Buffalo Trace. Yeah. So this whiskey at one point was made at Stitzel Weller and made at Buffalo Trace. Mind-blowing to me. That is wild, actually. Um, again, through ownership changes, uh, eventually Shenley decides to try to buy Jack Daniels. Now, Jack Daniels was the first Tennessee distillery to be legal. Okay. And that's 1940s. So you think about it, in the 1940s, the first legal distillery opens in Tennessee. Yeah. Bonkers. Why? Because Tennessee stayed in Prohibition until 1939. So Prohibition in America, 1920 to 1933. Prohibition in Tennessee, 1910 to 1939. That's wild. So... They were in Prohibition for 29 years in Tennessee. We were in it for 13. Um, Shenley tries to buy the distillery, late 1950s. They can't, so they decide to reopen the Cascade Distillery. 
and they start production at George Dickel back up there, making it the second legal distillery in Tennessee. In 1959, there are two legal distilleries. They don't open a third distillery in Tennessee until 1990s with a distillery called Pritchard's. At, in the year 2000, there are three distilleries in all of Tennessee. That's wild. It's bonkers. Um, since 2010, that number's gone up to 19, to uh, about 33. Hey, Peter, uh, we're going to get to the Chattanooga when we bounce over to uh, Spirits Guide later on. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of wild that in Tennessee, which is right next door to Kentucky, yeah. they're basically dry. In fact, where they make Jack Daniels now, it's still a dry county. You, like, yeah. you can't drink Jack Daniels where they make Jack Daniels. It's mind-blowing. That me. is weird. Uh, really wild. So George Dickel um, has kind of come along as a brand three years ago. They hired Nicole Austin as their master distiller. Uh, so one of the very few female master distillers in the industry. Um, and then two years ago, she put out a bottled in bond. I believe it was a 13-year, uh, which ended up becoming Whiskey Advocate's number one whiskey of the year. So uh, she has paid dividends um, for sure. These guys are owned by Diageo, which is a big liquor company that actually owns Guinness and a bunch of other brands. Um, so yeah, it's the number two selling Tennessee whiskey couple of things that make them special they actually chill filter the distillate before they run it through uh, that Lincoln County process which is kind of unique to them and also they focus their making of whiskey in the winter huh. whereas a lot of them make it in the summer they like yeah. to work in the cooler months um, which they feel gives them a smoother product uh, in fact they market it as smooth as moonlight what else we got? Uh, they spell it without an E. <clears throat> we'll talk about that one in a second. So no E. Whiskey without the E. Um, because George Dickel felt that his whiskey was as smooth as any Scotch whiskey. And there's yeah. no E in Ooh, Scotch gosh. whiskey. Okay. Um, I think I got all of the, the cool sort of info. Um, Yeah, a little info from Peter Thomas That's there. Right. Uh, 19, uh, 2017, uh, Tennessee passes a law to allow uh, drink sales at distilleries, even in dry counties, uh, so you can get it at Jack Daniels at the distillery, uh, but oh. not in town. That's wild. So we have three different versions of George Dickel. Uh, they actually make a few other ones. Uh, this is the number eight. This is the Barrel Select, which is a blend of six to ten barrels. And this is their rye whiskey. Now, it doesn't say Tennessee on the front label uh, because they actually buy their rye from MGP. Okay. Uh, so when we taste that, you're going to recognize that flavor profile. It is that signature MGP Mashville 95.5. Uh, Mashville on the Dickel whiskeys, 84% uh, corn, 8% barley, 8% rye. So really, really high corn content, 8-8. Um, eight and eight. That mash bill is going to come back around when we go over to Spirits Guide later on, uh, I promise, as we have some fun. So let's taste through, because <clears throat> uh, I think we tasted these a little bit last week. Yep. <clears throat> I feel like this is a brand that just needs some love. I feel like people just don't... Yeah, it's very overlooked, I believe. <clears throat> especially, especially that. Yeah. But unfortunately, we don't talk price here anymore because uh, spies have a shutdown. We know you're watching. Yeah. <laughs> but these whiskeys are just plain good. Um, and while we appreciate all of you who are getting into the whiskey game um, and you're starting to read blogs about Weller and Blantons and Pappy and all that, in the fall, Bill Belichick always says the greatest availability, uh, greatest ability is availability, yep. and these are things that are on the shelf all the time, and they're good. I think the first thing you notice is it doesn't smell like traditional bourbon. Yeah, it's not those big caramel, vanilla notes. They're more nutty peanuts. Um, yeah, definitely peanuts. 
It reminds me of like Cracker Jacks almost. Yeah, yeah. Like, like caramel corn nut. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Sweet. With that corn. Um, I want to say that's four to six year blend. Not sure off the, the top of my head. Proof point on that. So it's 80 proof. Super easy to drink. I um, actually did all the old granddads last night. Yep. And I found like the 80 proof old granddad is the sweetest out of all of them. Yeah. So that lower proof makes it really, really accessible, easy to drink. Yeah, I could just sit back and get penalties. Sit sip those down. Um, but great. You talk about like bourbon and lemonade, like that. Yeah. Um, the lemonade or that Fever Tree sparkling lemon soda. Uh, we have it available here in handles for an undisclosed price. Awesome. Uh, <clears throat> Jay's out there watching. Hey, Jay, how are you? Um, by the way, Jay, I have your E.H. Uh, e. Taylor bottle here. Uh, thanks for letting me borrow that. <clears throat> this, to me, is probably... Uh, fiber in my throat from wearing masks all day. <clears throat> you pour your own on that. Nuttiness just jumps right on the on this. Um, 86 proof, so they're not going for those big big proof points, yeah. which sometimes is refreshing. Um, and despite the fact that this is only 80, it's still got big body. Yeah, it does. And that's 86, but it's still got that big nose. This to me is that's a gem to me. nuttiness and spice at the end. It's fantastic. Yeah, there's a sophistication to that. Um, there's an elegance to that. Yeah, that sweet sort of peanuty. Mm. That's awesome. And then last but not least, um, <clears throat> again, if you like rye and Jay and I kind of chatted about it. Of, like, we'd like to just buy a barrel of MGP rye and bring it home and drink it. Because it's just so good. Um, again, that great 95.5 mash bill. Not going to say how much it is, but... These are all great values at the price point that they're at. And I think you're going to recognize that nose. Yeah. Big rye. Yep. <clears throat> that is MGP signature without a doubt. I mean, when you see that mash bill on there, 95.5, distilled in, in Indiana, you know exactly where it's coming from. Yeah. And anybody who thinks sourced whiskeys are, are not good or... Grow up. Fooling, fooling themselves, without a doubt. It's the same mash bill. I feel like that's got it's a uniqueness to it. Absolutely, um, and that's why I don't knock the source whiskey. Is you think uh, how much whiskey MGP makes, how many Rick houses they have. Yeah, <coughs> everything in the Rick house is a little different. 
And these guys are getting to go in and, and pick their barrels to yeah. get their flavor profile. Yeah, there's a common thread with a bunch of other ryes we've tasted, but that is bigger. It's weird, still lingering. spicier, yeah. A little bit of that, like, chocolate mint on the finish. Mm. That's awesome, yeah. I am getting that chocolate mint, because I never really got that for, at first. Mm. I feel like the aftertaste, that's what I'm getting. I feel like... So when I learned to taste, I sat in a room with some people, and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and I listened to them talk. Mm. And they would describe things. It was actually wine. Um, and they would say, like, ah, oh, it's got raspberry. I'm in trouble. <laughs> and so I would taste things, and I would look for raspberry. Like, in my mind, I'm looking on the palate, like, where is it? There it is. And it takes a while before it, it kind of flips to where you're like, vanilla. Where's the vanilla? Where's the vanilla? To where you're not thinking and looking for it. Now you're letting it kind Pump of come it, in, yeah. and you can kind of figure it out on your own. It just takes practice. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when we were doing, like, the gin bracket, I remember, like... I was trying not to let you uh, influence mm. my, my my tasting or my profile because we could be tasting two totally different things just because of the way we are, you know? Yep. And sometimes it's what your brain interprets. Um, yeah. You know, what you think raspberry is to you. Yeah, it could be completely <clears throat> different than yeah. what you think it is. Yeah, exactly. But after a while, and uh, when we were down in Kentucky, we were at... Uh, there's a place next to Moonshine University called Flavor Man, and they develop the flavors for every soft drink yeah. in the country. Um, we we're kind of joking about after a while of doing this, you realize that everything you pick up, you immediately start to smell like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it just becomes a sort of natural, what do I get on it? And sometimes you smell things, and you're like, I don't know what that is. Yeah. Um, like, I would never thought sandalwood no idea that that was even a thing yeah and then i had smelled some sandalwood while i was down there and uh <clears throat> yeah peter uh dicko rye would make a fantastic mint julep what's uh, that mint julep? so mint julep uh i just read an article on it too it's basically the official drink of the kentucky derby okay. so it's bourbon uh simple syrup mint crushed ice okay and at the derby they serve it in a silver cup Kind of like mules in a yeah, copper yeah, mug. Yeah. Um, yeah, this would make a great mint julep because of that sort of chocolate mint accent to it. I also think it would make a great Bloody Mary, kind of like we do with the Ezra Brooks as well. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, and so, and we'll talk about it more when we get to the other stuff in the Spirits Guide into this. But, like, when you look at these bottles, first of all, are they good? Yes. Yes. Uh, are they worth the money? Hands down. Um, does the bottle start a conversation on the bar? I think it does. To me, that's a very old school yeah. kind of look. Um, and if I walked into a saloon in Tennessee, that's the bottle. That's yeah. the bottle I would kind of expect to see. Like, I feel like the packaging is great. This definitely. I mean, yeah. That's Top awesome. shelf. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it. If somebody walks into your house and sees that bottle on your bar, they're going to want to try it. Um, and that, like, if you had any doubt whether or not that was a rye, yeah. I mean, the green label yeah. just pops. And kind of also funny, that's a 90 proof rye where the bourbons are all 86, 80. So a little bit higher proof point on the rye. I wonder why that is. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's just because of MGP, if they decide to leave it at that proof. But there's no heat on that whatsoever either. No, no, that's, no, no. Uh, I kind of wish we could get that in nips. That would probably replace Ezra. Sure, yeah, it? yeah, it really would. Hey, favorite rye. That is delicious, and the more I drink that, the better it tastes. You got a favorite? Um, I love the rye, but I'm not going to go with that. that yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, to me, that is the most tragically overlooked yeah. bottle in our aisle, um, without a doubt. So, yeah, it kind of started me on this rabbit hole of, of 
the Tennessee whiskey and you know some of the other ones that we have out there now uh, Heaven's Door yep um, Uncle Nearest super important brand um, got some more of that coming in tomorrow uh, yeah there's a few other ones uh, Bell Mead which has their own yep. distillery down there um, we'll talk about them when we bounce over to uh, yeah awesome so I think we're gonna wrap it here but if you guys want to stick around anybody who's following spirits guide bounce over in about five or ten minutes just give us time to reset the cameras um, we're gonna bounce over there have some fun um, yeah we'll see you in a few minutes <laughs> cheers guys thanks guys I got it